How can inflation run so hot if the consumer is running so cold? Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romaine Boston. And I'm Alex Steele. And I told you guys I was on a budget, and I stuck <laughs> to it. Retail sales prove it. We're kicking you off uh, to the closing bell right here in the U.S. S&P at a record high. It doesn't feel as exuberant as it did the first time we hit a record high just a couple days ago, and we really crossed the Rubicon of 5,000. But nonetheless, record territory, here we come. We also filled the gap that we saw from Tuesday when we had that big gap down. S&P Energy, the best performing sector. Oil also getting a bid. All that sector up by about 3%. On the downside, one of the worst performing stocks within the S&P Romaine is Deer. Their quarter was fine, but their outlook was worrying. And basically, it's the beginning of the downturn in the ag sector. So watch that space. And the 10-year yield just down by one basis point. But what that does show, Romaine, if you get yields high enough, there are the buyers out there that will continue to come in, in equities and bonds, and buy the dip. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit more about what's been going on in the Treasury space, but I want to focus just for a quick second here on the latest batch of 13F filings. That 13F season has come and gone, and the most interesting filing, at least for me, it wasn't from the hedge funds, but from NVIDIA, the AI chip darling spreading its wings with investments in ARM, SoundHound, Recursion Pharmaceuticals, as well as a few others. Recursion, which use artificial intelligence to identify cellular disease treatments, rallying as much as 20% here on the day. SoundHound, which makes AI audio software surging as much as 80% in ARM, which NVIDIA has a long and complicated relationship, uh, rose as much as 6% at one point intraday. NVIDIA also disclosing stakes in medical imaging company NanoX, which doubled in price today, and in self-driving tech uh, company Too Simple, which jumped almost 90% today. Some breathtaking gains there in the chip and AI space and some interesting gains as well for crypto stocks and Bitcoin. The biggest cryptocurrency flirting with 53,000 while the biggest U.S. crypto exchange Coinbase set to report earnings after the bell and those earnings might actually be well actual earnings. Expectations for Coinbase is to turn profitable for the first time in two years on the back of elevated trading volumes after Bitcoin jumped almost 60% last quarter alone. Now, whether the January regulatory approval of those spot Bitcoin ETFs helps or harms Coinbase, still an open question, but maybe we're going to get some answers on that after the bell tonight. But let's go back to what Alex was talking about, and that is the bond market and the U.S. economy were for months. Investors have been dealing with clashing narratives, a clash even more pronounced this week with a red-hot inflation report and ice-cold retail sales numbers. Retail sales numbers, Alex, that apparently you didn't help out with, dropping the most in almost a year. No one believes me, but I yeah. didn't. Are you a shopper? You are a shopper. <laughs> Don't did, tell. My wife watches the did, show, so no. Did you shop? In, no, he didn't shop in January either. Let's be clear. Uh, so it was not only January, but the revisions down uh, for the last couple of months as well. So I love this chart as a way to look at it. It's Bloomberg Economics and their uh, GDP now uh, forecast. Basically, they're going to take some inputs, put it into their model, and tell you what growth is actually going to be. And you can see here the negative drag that retail sales is going to be on that forecast, down by about uh, 25 basis points. Now it's offset by things like business activity in the Philly area, the deficit ratio and, and the jobs market. This is jobless claims, but nonetheless, a material drag. I think the question is, do other parts of the economy make up for it? Or does, are we in the beginning, the beginning of some kind of real slowdown remain? Yeah. Uh, well, let's pose that question to our first guest here as we kick you off to the close on this uh, Thursday afternoon, Lisa Shallot joining us, Chief Investment Officer at Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. And Lisa, I mean, there's such a, a, a big question right now about economic conditions. And I am curious about whether we're focusing a little bit too much or focusing a little bit too much on the wrong thing. Well, I, I mean, that's a loaded question a little bit. Uh, you know, clearly, I think that, that uh, the focus needs to remain uh, on the outlook for inflation and uh, obviously the outlook for uh, growth. Uh, the two of those combined have implications for the labor market and in turn are going to determine what the Fed uh, is going to do for the rest of this year. Uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, we have to always compare uh, where we are with what expectations were. I think coming into the year, folks were preparing themselves uh, for a soft landing that included economic slowing. So right now, I think we've had more upside surprises uh, on growth than, than downside ones. And so on balance, while those retail sales are disappointing, uh, I think we're still in the plus column in terms of 
first quarter growth coming in better uh, than a lot of people uh, had uh, mm -hmm. forecast on Gen Y. We're certainly seeing that in the economic data. Our corporate fundamentals, at least based on what we've learned from this earnings season, is that supportive? Yeah, look, I, I think that it's been a little bit more uh, dispersion in, in the overall earnings season. We've had, you know, some good guidance and some good beats uh, among some companies, uh, but others we know are struggling to expand profit margins, which in many cases were baked into some of their original uh, guidance. And so uh, what's interesting is that uh, we still have negative earnings revision breadth meaning on balance, when we look at the number of companies revising up outlooks and those revising down outlooks, uh, we're still on the negative side of that. And part of that is has to do with the fact that expectations have, have been uh, pretty rosy uh, for 2024 and 2025, with the consensus looking for 11 to 12 percent year on year growth after a year uh, where maybe for the full year of 2023, we're going to eke out uh, you know, maybe only two or three percent growth. Lisa, I'm trying to understand what would ever disrupt the buy the dip narrative. Uh, I feel like I've been skeptical of this rally for what, Romain? A month? Two yeah, weeks? maybe longer than that. Uh, maybe longer than that. Five weeks. And I continue to be proven wrong. Good thing I don't invest money. So to that point, like, what's it going to take for the market to wind up going down? Buy the dip, no matter what asset class you're in, still seems to be the narrative for the U.S., yeah, so I, I think as long as there's excess liquidity in the system, we're going to have uh, the ability uh, for uh, investors to come in and think that they're getting a bargain and, and participate, uh, to your point, in all asset classes uh, when, you know, there's some evidence of weakness. Um, you know, by and large, our forecast has been that liquidity is finally going to start tightening. Uh, in in the later part of this year, as we start, you know, to see Janet Yellen having to issue a little bit more treasuries as the bite of quantitative tightening, you know, continues, uh, and as some of the issues around commercial real estate mm -hmm. uh, and the regional banks, uh, you know, presses on on financial conditions. All right, let me flip it. What's it going to take for a small cap rally? And we are definitely seeing it today to be real and sustainable. <laughs> Yeah. So, look, I think what what small caps are really going to require is a belief uh, that this is a soft landing that turns into a reacceleration of growth. Uh, and we know that small caps have been a little bit more sensitive uh, to interest rates, a little bit more sensitive to the fears uh, about the cost of financing. Uh, and so on days when people uh, are, you know, bidding down yields and, and saying, hey, maybe growth will be cooler and the Fed can cut sooner. Uh, those are the days we're seeing some some broadening and participation from more cyclical, more value and more small cap uh, oriented sectors. But for this to really get going, uh, we're going to have to uh, be convinced. I think investors are going to have to be convinced that this rebound in, in growth is is multi quarter and sustainable. Yeah, well said. Lisa, I'm going to have to leave it there. Lisa Shallot there, best in the business, chief investment officer at Morgan Stanley Wealth Management, helping us kick off to the close here on this Thursday afternoon. Coming up, some great interviews up ahead, including with the CFO of Ford, John Lawler, on deck. We're going to get his insights on Ford's plans for electric vehicles in 2024 as the sector faces a series of headwinds. Plus, Bitcoin's market cap climbs back above $1 trillion in a broad crypto rally. We'll discuss that and more with Anthony Scaramucci, founder of Skybridge Cap. And earnings season, it never sleeps. A lot of uh, companies scheduled to report after the bell, including Coinbase, DraftKings, DoorDash, and Roku. Full coverage and full analysis as soon as those numbers cross. Nowhere else other than here on The Close on Bloomberg. We think 2024 is probably a bit tricky year, uh, but uh, 2025 you will see again the thing picking up because everybody will have to match mm -hmm. uh, the targets in 2025. What we actually see is people who will enter the electrification through uh, plug-in electric hybrids and then migrate to full EVs over time. So I'm, I'm still bullish on EVs. So we continue to lean in 
I think a real concern is with uh, with charging infrastructure and making sure that that charging infrastructure is available and ready. There definitely is a slowdown of, of EV adoption, although I, this, a transformation of this magnitude was never going to be completely linear. I think one of the important things is continuing to build out the charging infrastructure. I think we shouldn't doubt about the fact that EV will be a dominant technology in Europe. Maybe not the only one, okay, but uh, it will be very, very strong, I think. A slew of industry executives speaking on Bloomberg about the challenges and the opportunities ahead for the EV market. And we want to continue that conversation right now with another major industry executive. John Lawler is the chief financial officer over at Ford. John, a real pleasure to have you here on set. Thanks for having me. My big question is, when am I going to get to buy an $11,000 EV from Ford? <laughs> well, it's coming. Um, when? When? Well, I think you'll have to wait a few more years. But, um, you know, one of the advantages we have is we've been out with our first generation vehicles now for up to three years. We've been developing our second generation of vehicles, which is a whole new breakthrough. We've brought in people from outside of Ford that have expertise in that, and we are developing a low-cost EV platform so that we can be a big part of this S-curve when it comes time. And that is, I think, coming uh, in a couple years from now, okay. and I think it's going to be a big inflection point for the industry when more affordable EVs come online. Do you feel like the industry was surprised by the hybrid? I know that everyone has some hybrids, but really Toyota bet a lot on that farm. Mm -hmm. And it feels like the industry went full throttle into high-end EVs. Do you feel like we missed a trick here? No, I don't think so. One of the things about Ford that's really good is we lead in hybrids as well. We have the number one selling hybrid truck and the number one two selling hybrid truck. Um, it grew 20% for us last year. We expect it to grow 40% this year. So we have the ability to provide our customers choice, gas, hybrid, and EV. And I think that's really important in the transition because it is a stepping stone for consumers. But what's that balance right now? Because it seemed, at least coming into this year and really last year, when you started to see the rollout of, uh, of the Mach-E and the Lightning, and you started to get this sense here that this was the direction the company was going. When the sales numbers came in, we mm -hmm. saw that demand was at least less than some of the initial projections. Right, demand is yeah. less on the, on the yeah. electric vehicles. Yeah. We have three divisions, and we broke them out into segments last year so that you can see what's happening with each of the businesses. Mm -hmm. We're growing across all three of those businesses. Mm -hmm. Our pro business is very profitable. Our blue business is profitable. Mm -hmm. And EVs, we're still incurring losses at the start. But what you're finding is that um, as this transition happens, mm -hmm. it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when and how quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're seeing. Yes, it's slower than what people thought. Right. The S curve or the adoption curve is less because we're now moving from early adopters to early majority. Mm -hmm. And there's different satisfaction issues that they have around charging and or price that needs to be resolved. So you're still confident on the long-term trajectory? I, very confident. As you know, of course, Wall Street investors tend to focus a little bit more on the short term. And when they look at some of the losses in that unit, the question that seems to come up time and time again is, until we get to whatever that future is going to be, how much of the development on the EV side of that business can sort of feed into some of the other businesses in a way that maybe mitigates or at least makes those losses a little bit uh, more manageable? Well, there are technologies we're mm -hmm. developing that will be part of the electric business, mm -hmm. but will also be used across our pro business and our ICE business, our gas business. Mm -hmm. And that's things like the digital electrical architecture, which is a new upgrade we're going to bring forward here in the next couple of years that's going to change the whole experience you have with the vehicle from the way you interface with the interior of the vehicle and then our ability to update the vehicle over the air and provide new features or experiences or services. And that'll be across all three. So part of the development for the electric business is also going to help the gas business mm -hmm. as well as the commercial business. So just broad picture too, and I've covered commodities for a long time. Um, I'm hearing reports like Glencore, for example, they might have to shutter a nickel mine because the demand for EVs isn't there and that's causing them problems on the mining side. What I see playing out though is when that S curve really moves, you're not going to have the stuff. Like how do you make sure you have the nickel the uh, lithium, all the stuff you need when the demand isn't there today. Right. Go back 18 months, right? Okay, 18 okay. months ago. 18 months ago, the narrative was, look, people aren't going to have the minerals so every, or the batteries, so you have to vertically integrate. You have to create your own battery plants, right? So th it's shifted a bit. I think what needs to happen now is we need to be more thoughtful as we go forward. And of course, we're going to have to balance that. But I think the demand signals as we move through time are going to be much clearer than they were 
a year ago or two years ago. And so I think we'll have a little bit more time to get out in front of things. What is your biggest headache? I'm going to give you like five multiple choice, okay? Okay. So, we can, so what's the biggest headache you have right now? Is it government policy? Because that could change in like eight months. Tesla price cuts, competition from cheap China EVs, or your costs, whether that's labor, whether that's material cost or interest rates. Yes. Awesome. Good. I'm glad <laughs> yes. we solved that. <laughs> those are all, those are three key variables that we need to work on uh, continuously. What's the hardest for you? Um, I would say that right now, um, it's cost. It's making sure that we get to an affordable cost structure that can allow us to generate what you started out with is an affordable EV that can appeal to more customers. How do you do that, though? I mean, we look at competitors. I mean, I think you kind of referenced BYD. Uh, obviously, we know that the sort of business model that Tesla has taken here. The structure of Ford is the structure of its supply chain. The relationship you have with your workers and the contracts you have with unions puts you at a higher baseline cost level than some of those uh, pure play EV competitors. Well, you know, there's advantages as well yeah. um, that we have. And that's why we've started what we call the Skunk Works Project, which is a small group of uh, EV experts working outside of Dearborn to develop the most uh, cost-effective uh, platform from not only from the standpoint of the material cost that's required, but also the manufacturing, the supply chain, mm -hmm. the logistics, and then how we distribute and uh, sell the vehicles, we're looking at taking breakthroughs there. And that's why we have a small team working on that mm -hmm. to change the way we do things and actually provide us significant breakthroughs. And we love what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's been fantastic, and we're really encouraged by their work. How many, uh, What's the, been the conversation uh, at Ford about the charging network? Uh, there's been a lot of discussion that some of the slow pace of EV adoption, and we should point out non-Tesla EV adoption, was less about the individual automakers and more about what most people perceive as a lackluster charging network across well, the nation. Well, clearly that's a pain point yeah. for EV customers. Um, what we've done is we've thought about what would be the best for our customers. Yeah. Well, first is you know that uh, we're joining the Tesla Charge Network. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we've done is for all of our EV dealers, what we've said is that to be an EV dealer, we've set standards. One of those standards is that they have to have high-speed charging. Mm -hmm. And on average, you are no further than 20 miles from a Ford dealer in the United States, wherever mm -hmm. you're at. That's going to open up significant charging for our customers as well. Are the majority of your dealers on board with this? A majority of the dealers are becoming certified EV dealers. The ones that aren't? What's your relationship with them? Well, I think they'll come along. They'll have another opportunity to do that. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's a, the adoption rate's different around the country. If you take yeah. the West Coast, like Oregon, Washington, and California, 30% of our F-Series sales are EV. Another 15 to 20% are hybrid. So up to 50% of our F-Series sales yeah. out on the West Coast are uh, electric vehicles. That's what happens when gasoline's over $5 on exactly. a consistent basis. You're <laughs> exactly. like, I'm gonna go with the EV. I don't care about charging network. Um, to policy, so two, two pronged. One is that the Biden administration supports EVs and also have stringent requirements on what sales have to be of EVs. But then you have a possible President Trump that wouldn't care about EVs. Which policy is better? Well, I don't know that one's better than the other. I'm not going to get you down that road. You have to say that, but, yeah. I mean, but, one, but, yeah. but I think what we need to think about is that you also have the states involved as well. Mm -hmm. And the, regardless of what is done at the federal level, I think the states are going to continue down the path they're down. And that's going to drive us to be more, uh, more efficient from a uh, CO2 standpoint and need to meet their compliance requirements. So I think it's multifaceted, and you have to look at each of those variables, federal, state, and uh, satisfy both of those. And then to that point, the, the battery factories or construction that you're building across different states like in Kentucky, Tennessee, or Michigan, you've already cut some of those. What is your level of confidence at where you guys are at right now with those investments stay? Very confident. We okay. think we've right-sized based on the demand curves we see now, which have been adjusted down. So we've right-sized the capacity going in, and I think we're in a good spot relative to what we see coming. All right, John, appreciate you taking time for us. John Lawler there is the CFO over at Ford uh, Motor. And, you know, Alex, you know this, uh, and, of course, we have uh, someone here, Matt Miller, of course, who's been very tapped into sort of that EV rollout, and there was just so much excitement when you started to see that lineup, whether it was the Mach-E or the Lightning or, or obviously some of the other comp competitors at GM and elsewhere here, and you just kind of wonder when we sort of get that mojo back, when we get past the early adopters and we get to the regular folks and who make that transition. Which is also really funny when you take a look at policy, but on a pure, like, market dynamic, 
when you're consistently having to pay five bucks a gallon, EVs yeah. look a lot more appealing. And that's it's sort of as simple as that in some ways. And California's regulatory um, uh, stringent requirements for things like that in terms of gasoline, et cetera, have provided that yeah. for EVs. All right, great conversation. Uh, stick with us. A lot more coming up here on The Close. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's get right to the, our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off with Super Micro, Bank of America starting coverage with a buy rating and a street high $1,040 price target. To put that in context, the average price target on the street, right around 681. Bank of America says it's justified, though, expecting the market for AI servers to skyrocket over the next three years, to which Super Micro will benefit big time because of its relationships with companies like NVIDIA, AMD, and Intel. Those shares, which need hope, no help as of late, up 12% here on the day. Next up, let's take a look at Akamai. Getting cut to reduce from hold over at HSBC, the analyst concerned about persistent weakness in Akamai's core content business and expects the firm will fail to deliver on its 2024 projections. Those shares down about 3% here on the day. And finally, Coinbase getting a raise to neutral over at JP Morgan. Analyst Kenneth Worthington attributing the upgrade to the recent surge in Bitcoin and inflows into those new ETFs. He sees higher token prices not only sustaining, but improving activity levels and Coinbase's earnings power. Those earnings coming after the bell tonight. Those shares up almost 3% on the day. And those, Alex, are some of our top calls. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting uh, for Coinbase because it could be profitable when it reports, and that would be like a really big moment uh, for the industry. So uh, it's going to be after the market uh, closed today. They're looking to see about transaction uh, revenue and if earnings will finally uh, turn positive, Romaine. And again, yeah. it could be a big moment. And I'm really curious to see uh, whether they have some commentary on how these new spot Bitcoin ETFs affect them. Because yeah. there was so much concern that if you can sort of buy into an ETF at a cheaper transaction cost than buying directly through Coinbase, uh, that maybe that hurts them in the long term. But, of course, they have a lot of other products, and they also, of course, offer trading in the ETFs themselves, not to mention that they're also uh, doing a lot of the settlement as well. Yeah, so. I'm also curious is just in general – how normal people like us, how much we're actually going to allocate into something like Bitcoin. Yeah. Like the believers are like 10 percent, 10 percent. But is it really going to be like half a percent and one percent? That's funny. You think you're normal? Oh, no, 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 no. I meant like, mm, am I normal? This is a you're much unique. deeper you're conversation. Unique, it's a much deeper conversation. All right, more coming up. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Just about 3.30 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. And in case you're counting, you have a record for the S&P yet again. Mm. I don't feel the enthusiasm as yeah. I did before. We are, it's not matched by the Russell or the Nasdaq 100 or anything, but we have sort of filled that gap that we made on Tuesday. Yeah, 5,027 doesn't really make for a good hat or T-shirt. It? Yeah. No, it's no so, balloons yeah. for that. Um, I also wonder, too, if part of the appeal of U.S. equities is that everything else kind of stinks. Uh, there was a real string uh, of mixed eco data uh, complicating the Fed's move and other central banks are struggling to stabilize their economies. Let's check this out. Japan unexpectedly slipping into a recession after shrinking for a second quarter. U.K. also slipping, in, slipping into a mild recession the second half of the year. And the European Commission downgraded growth for 2024 as well. So we want to take a moment and look at the global implications with Bloomberg opinion columnist John Authors and Stuart Paul of Bloomberg Economics. Stuart, is that what I'm looking at? Is like the U.S. the cleanest shirt on a dirty laundry list or something? I think that's right. I mean, but it is <laughs> difficult to call it a clean shirt per se. I mean, we just saw today the retail sales actually declined in the month of January, starting the year, declined 0.8% during the month. Even if you strip out some of the more interest-sensitive items and you strip out things that might be affected by weather and foot traffic, like food services, you're still looking at a control group that declined 0.4% and industrial production also declining during the month. So I, I'd be hard-pressed to say that it's a clean shirt, but maybe the cleanest of the cleanest, bunch. Cleanest. Cleanest. John, what say you? Um, well, it's certainly a cleaner shirt than we have back home in Britain, regrettably, um, but obviously, truly. Yeah, the, the, this is 
it, it's, it's ironic given the amount of arguments about America first, as though America isn't putting things itself first at the moment, that America is in fact doing an extremely good job somehow or other, whether it's all those good capitalists out there or politicians in Washington, somehow or other America is managing to come out first in economic terms at the moment, um, despite this, yeah. this sense of decline that permeates all discussions in the in this country, it's palpably yeah. doing better than anyone else. Yeah, we tend to do that here in the U.S. We love ourselves, John. Uh, <laughs> I, I am curious, though. But we should it'd be remiss in not pointing out, mm. though. I, I mean, we talk about how well the economies perform, how well the markets have performed. But then, you know, there are a lot of people that will point over to Japan and they'll look at a 14 yeah. percent gain in the Nikkei just to start the year and the outperformance that we've seen there. And that's really gotten a lot of folks now saying, or at least prior to the last couple of days, saying, mm. OK, this is now where it's going to be the new economic growth engine, but we've now gotten some data that seems to say that maybe that narrative was a little premature. Yeah, the latest uh, numbers suggesting GDP is actually um, coming back down. Certainly at the margin reduces the likelihood that um, the BOJ carries on with what everybody has been assuming, including me, which is that yeah. yield curve control cannot last much longer, that yeah. bond yields will have to rise, and uh, this does increase the possibility that they might hold on for longer, uh, validating the people who had been selling the yen and I had been saying they were not terribly sensible to do so. Uh -huh. um, that said, there is a difference between the stock market and the economy. A lot of the, if you remember the third arrow of Arbenomics from a decade ago. Was okay, supposed I don't to be, remember, but tell Okay, me, the, yeah. the, there were three arrows, uh, okay. monetary, fiscal and corporate governance. Yeah. Um, apparently coming from some ancient Japanese fable, I, okay. I, I gather, and I the, and not, not that I'm an expert, and the third arrow never fired while the late yeah. Abe Shinzo was in power. The fact that corporate governance really does seem to be improving and changing in Japan, that they're disgorging more cash, that they're doing more buybacks, does, right. does have a good, does give you a valid reason for their stock market to be doing relatively well despite what's happening to the economy. I am curious about just the correlations between nations right now, Stuart. I mean, mm. uh, John had a great column where he kind of, you know, talks about the butterfly effect and whether we should be concerned. But there's been a lot of discussion, too, saying that the way that the world is connected now maybe isn't as tight as it was in years past when one country, you know, sneezed and the other one got a cold, whatever the phrase was at the time. I think that that's right. I think that it might be downstream from geopolitical issues, geopolitical tensions and call it multi call it multilateralism call it multipolarization uh, that's all a part of it but I think that a bigger part of it probably is about what's creating those tensions to begin with which is additional onshoring and sort of a rotation towards focusing on a manufacturing base for example in the United States so uh, I, I think that that is true that it's probably not the case that one country sneezes and the rest of the world catches cold at least not to the extent that it used to be uh, but uh, we do see some correlations across countries, which is, so, at least in most of the DM world, not necessarily always the case in Japan, yeah. but a rotation in monetary policy towards some easing in most of the big DM countries. So there is still a bit of a correlation there. DM is a cool thing for developed markets, not yeah. like direct message, you. but you know, it's fair. <laughs> yeah. um, cool so it's what the cool yeah. kids call it. Um, mm. Focusing on Japan for a second, I wonder if the risk is that then the BOJ continues to not do anything. Or is the risk that they actually do hike? Like, what causes that, like, carry risk event that could really wind up shaking out the markets that does have a material effect uh, on what we see economically? John, what do you think? Uh, almost certainly the single most important is the Shunto. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, which, which is, is the... the wage uh, increases, right? Yes, so uh, which um, Japan is still a fairly corporatist place. They're, doing, they're going through this big round of... Uh, wage, wage negotiations that always start at the beginning of the year. Uh, I had a, a link to a piece from Asahi Simbun which just, just looks so bizarre, read from here, where both employers' organisations and unions were saying, yes, we want to have wage increases a long way ahead of inflation, um, which is you know, very much of a sort of looking glass world to, to uh, people worrying about the Phillips curve here. If you really do get big real wage increases in Japan, I think that does probably become the point when uh, the Bank, Bank of Japan is very used to using that kind of Phillips curve notion. That is when they think it's safe to tighten. If you get a damp squib, mm. Shunto, then maybe mm. 
a lot of assumptions need to be, at the, at the very least, postponed a lot. I think that's their key number they're looking at, though. All right, guys, a great conversation. I'm going to have to leave it there. John Authors, Bloomberg Opinion columnist, and Stuart Paul over at Bloomberg Economics. A great read here on economic conditions, a great read here on the correlations between countries. We're going to turn back to the U.S. Uh, equity market here. Seeing a modest rally on our hands and one of the biggest gainers in the S&P 500, believe it or not, Wells Fargo having its best day in more than a year. This after U.S. regulators ended a consent order related to its sales practices. A discussion up ahead, our stock of the hour. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back. We're counting you down to the close. Less than 20 minutes until we get to the bells. And one of the biggest movers right now in the S&P 500, get this, Wells Fargo shares up 8%, at least the best day for this stock going back to mid-2022. This after learning that the U.S. Office of the Comptroller of the Currency ended a 2016 consent order against the bank. Abigail Doolittle joining us now to talk a little bit more about this. And we should just clarify, there are multiple consent orders against this company. I lost track of how many. But the, one being, lift, but the <laughs> one being lifted today is probably one of the more consequential ones because it involves your ability to sell new products. It does, and it's also yeah. a perception thing because, of mm -hmm. course, everybody and anybody, not just us on Wall Street or Business News, knew and heard about the fake account scandal situation back in, back in the day when their targets were so aggressive that people within the bank were creating fake accounts on the part of consumers just to make the numbers, and that just the optics of that are really clearly pretty bad. So uh, in response to that, the uh, OCD, OCC, basically the feds, put uh, this framework on them. It's called a consent order where they basically have to put all kinds of rules and regulations in place to show that they're safe uh, for consumers, how they sell and offer their products. It's a framework, really. And CEO, and, and I should mention, you know, this is a sentiment thing, lifting, uh, but it took down two CEOs. I mean, it's been pretty ugly for Wells Fargo. The stock has really lagged some of the other stocks. Uh, the current CEO, Charlie Scharf, he said, uh, he's always said how important it is to have this kind of a framework in place. He used to be the CFO. Uh, and then he's saying that closing consent orders is an important sign of progress. But to your point, Romaine, so there were six that have gone, I think that includes this today, but there's eight more to go, including oh, wow. uh, identity protection and add-on products, uh, service member lending, uh, the big one, asset Assets. cap. Yeah. yeah, asset cap. And then unwanted auto insurance. It goes on and on and on. So, uh, yeah, they're Can not completely out of the woods. The obvious question, so the consent is is okay and it's lifted, then what happens? Like, Well, it's a great no point. Rules? So if there was no other consent orders, I would say, well, you know, it's human nature. Maybe they uh, just relax a little bit. But the, given the fact that... Uh, uh, the are so many other consent orders out there still, uh, including that asset one, because that's the big one. That basically says how much they can grow or not grow. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that hurt them during the pandemic. They couldn't open new uh, accounts, gain customers. Other than that, it really has not hurt them at all. In addition, they have uh, just this last fall, they settled a billion dollars with people who lost money on the stock. Apparently, they've agreed to settle another $5 billion. So basically, some of the regulatory handcuffs are coming off, lifting slowly but surely. And that could be a reason why the stock is reacting in such a positive way, that there's light at the end of the tunnel, because nobody knew when this big one would come off. They still don't know the, when the asset cap one will come off, maybe uh, next year. But it's at least a move in the right direction. All right. 
Abigail, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Great context. Uh, Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle joining us there. But nonetheless, right? Huge move. Uh, what yeah. Do for a stock 52 that, week high, not bad. Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, it's like, I think it's even double that, right? I mean, you got to go back to like mid 2022 to see a move like this. And it gets to the point where, well, well first of all, let's just say, I, I forgot they had, was it 13? I lost count, but it was six, eight. Uh, you do the math, carry the one, two. So that's 14 consent orders <laughs> that they had on top uh, of them. So <laughs> six of them have been, are gone now. Gone, yeah. And then eight left. Although the big one is, of course, that asset cap one. Yep. That get, they get asked about every single conference call. Yep. And then you just yeah. got to wait for that to be done. I also yeah. wonder, though, at this point, just how far behind they are to whom they consider their peers, right? Yeah. Like, they were going into different areas of business, right? They were trying to start up a little bit of an investment bank, but, like, they clearly can't compete with the big guys. Yeah, so it'll, how be do you do it? it'll be interesting to see uh, what direction uh, Sharf takes this, particularly now that maybe the regulatory handcuffs are going to be a little bit uh, looser, if you will. Yeah, maybe. We'll see. Yeah. All right, coming up, you got earnings on deck. We got Coinbase. We got Applied Materials. We have DoorDash. Do you do DoorDash? No, no, I we don't believe in that. No, I like cannot. I cannot no. pay that much money Sorry. for for the food being delivered. Yeah, anyway, Nicole dirty. Webb of the Wealth Enhancement Group is going to be joining us next, right before those earnings trickle out. This is the close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic here alongside Alex Steele. Just about 10 minutes until we get to the closing bells. And interesting, modest gains in the equity market right now. But when you put yesterday's gains along with today's gains, yep, yep, yep. we basically recouped the losses that we had from that big sell-off on Tuesday. We closed that gap. It must yeah. mean something. I mean, I think I technically what means that something means to somebody. That's <laughs> is sure. that you can have yeah. some follow-through gains, and it wasn't just a dead cat bounce from yesterday. However, uh, I mean, the gains aren't necessarily remarkable, but you're at a record high for the S&P. The Russell doing really well, very much outperforming. NASDAQ 100 doing a little bit of something. And I'm really watching dollar yen. We were just talking about that. Uh, the dollar taking another breather today. We were below that 150 level, but sort of how we get any intervention if we stay above 150 could have very big ramifications all across different asset classes remain. Yeah, it's really been pushing up against that line yep. and back down again, and it'll be interesting to see whether, well, BOJ feels a need to actually react. Meanwhile, back here in the U.S. markets, we go back to that rally, and we go back, really, to economic conditions. Wall Street looking past today's mixed data in anticipation for, well, tomorrow's data. Producer prices. We spoke to Morgan Stanley Wealth CIO Lisa Shallot about how the market is digesting all this data. I think coming into the year, folks were preparing themselves uh, for a soft landing that included economic slowing. So right now, I think we've had more upside surprises uh, on growth than, than downside ones. Lisa Shallot speaking earlier on the big program. Nicole Webb joining us right now to help us count down to the close. Senior Vice President and Financial Advisor at the Wealth Enhancement Group. Nicole? You're smiling. Did the did these economic reports that we got this week also get you smiling? I mean, yeah. They, there's the, nobody expected anything sp special about January. January is really this reset month, mm -hmm. and the choppiness a little bit expected. We saw a pop in the VIX that gave maybe a pause for concern. And then to Alex's point, here we are two days later. And we had a mixed bag of data this morning, mm -hmm. some continued softening in the consumer and mm -hmm. a bunch of companies that took their medicine, have strong free cash flow, profitable revenue guidance, mm -hmm. 80% of companies beat this earnings season. And so we go, all right, maybe we really can hit that 10% earnings per share growth mm -hmm. when we're sitting at five mm -hmm. and we still got 11 months ahead of us. And so, yeah. Well, I'm curious, so when you look at the earnings season and some of the commentary that we've gotten, as well as the numbers themselves here, I mean, what is the picture that corporate America, at least the big companies, what are they painting right now? Yeah, I think it, there's a, a tale of two stories. Mm -hmm. um, you've got some a lot of continued CEO sentiment around top line. So how do we continue to drive that sales volume mm -hmm. with the backdrop of we know the consumer is kind of taking it and taking it for quite a few years in a row. And some of this rolling over hasn't really started to hit. So we know that insurance premiums are going up across the board. Not everybody renewed in the first month of the year, whether that be homeowners or auto. I, there is pause for concern, I think, around the consumer and some of the euphoria around housing and being underproduced in housing, um, just the pricing of housing being really hard to manage. I think 
on survey basis, you're going to find a lot of consumers feeling like the cost of living specific to their home is really challenging. Mm -hmm. And those are people who are locked into 30-year mortgages. So again, you yeah. start to see some of the supply and demand dynamic, but also future pricing dynamics start yeah. to fall into consideration. So you heard that from the likes of Home Depot and Lowe's. Um, so all of that is you know, really working its way through the market. So I asked this question on Lisa Shallot too. What's it going to take for the market to actually go down? Like, it felt like Tuesday was the moment. And then I was like, now nah, you know what? We're going to have a little bit of a gap up. And we come in Wednesday. And we did. And we've continued. And we filled that gap. They're see by the dip and across all the asset classes. What is it going to take to change that? It's so interesting. You know, I think there was a question of, and I, I had written in my notes, I was just telling one of our analysts this two hours ago. I said, in my notebook a week ago, I wrote, what's going to happen to the market if the 10-year pushes above four and, a, four and a quarter? Oh, here we are about four and a quarter on the 10 year. And the market seems to not really care. Instead, we're seeing a little bit of a pullback against the NASDAQ, a little bit of a broadening out today. And, and so there's a lot of curiosity around what does that take? All I can say is that there are sectors of the market, we know which ones that are crowded and a little bit expensive. Mm -hmm. And so you feel like it's ripe for a bit of a pullback. Yeah. At the same time, you go, what is that stressor? What is that pressure that's going to happen? Yeah. And it's not looking like it's necessarily the Fed not cutting, which I think was where people's minds went initially. Okay, if we don't get it in March, if we don't get it in May, well, now we're pricing in for summer. It doesn't seem to be a big cause and effect. Yeah. So perhaps it's more that this trajectory to 10% 10, 10 earnings per share growth seems more solidified, and it takes one of those external yeah. events, so geopolitical noise, some, some sort of something. Yeah, hold that thought in conversation right now with Nicole Webb uh, over at the Wealth Enhancement Group. Some breaking news on Apple crossing the wire. Our very own Mark Gurman reporting that Apple's AI strategy now starting to gel. He's reporting that the company is nearing the completion of new software tools for its app developers that would be direct competition to Microsoft's Copilot uh, pro project. That's the GitHub Copilot project that, of course, Microsoft and Bing has been making a big deal about. Apple, of course, a lot of questions around their AI strategy and now getting word here that they're ready to roll this out, at least to developers, as soon as this year. We're still uh, with us is Nicole Webb from the Wealth Enhancement Group. And I do want to ask you about this, not necessarily specifically Apple, but just about all the sheen right now around mm -hmm. AI and whether that could actually be a material catalyst, not just for uh, you know, those, the stocks themselves, but even for the economy. I, yes. I think mm -hmm. sometimes we get so focused on Wall Street that we forget about this whole other part of the market that is held private, mm -hmm. which is where a lot of these big companies are living today still. We haven't even seen the IPO activity of bringing yeah. some of these household names like Chat, Chat GPT to the public markets. And so for me, I, and I smile as you release that news about Apple, because one of the conversations we're having a lot of behind the scenes is just going to be this rollover. And we've been so focused on Apple needing to figure out how to move towards um, a services platform. But instead, all of a sudden, it, it's, it's, there's going to be a lot of hardware that needs to come to market. And so it feels a little reminiscent of some of that digitization we saw in Internet advances, if we can all kind of have a moment to giggle about moving from dial-up to Wi-Fi to high-speed oh, Wi-Fi, yeah. and just kind of that rolling over of a computer moving from a box to not so much of a box to yeah. we're walking around with them. And so how does that all play out from a hardware at the enterprise yeah. and personal level? Yeah, well, I'm old enough to remember you had to like, plug the phone line into the <laughs> exactly. back of your computer just to uh, connect yeah. to it. And yeah. It would take you, you know, 10 minutes just to download one thing. Oh, Nicole, the worst. Yeah. great to have you. Nicole Webb, Senior Vice President and Financial Advisor at the Wealth Enhancement Group. And just to reiterate, uh, Alex, uh, just that news, uh, Mark Gurman, who's always over this, uh, really saying that they're trying to speed up, Apple trying to speed up development of this, a direct challenge to micro Microsoft's GitHub Copilot project. So here's, a, here's something interesting, too. Uh, apparently, its next iPhone and iPad software update, the iOS and the iPad OS 18, will include a slew of new AI features. That's according to people uh, familiar with the matter. So that's quite interesting uh, as well. And this is uh, Calp the Software, which is the code name Crystal. Yeah. One of the most significant updates in the 16-year history of the iPhone. Yeah, Huge. Be interesting, too. Uh, too. We're going to break down uh, that story as well as all the big market and moving events of the day. Stick with us. We're about to take you to the Bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. 
Romaine Bostic alongside Alex Steele. We're counting you down to the closing bell and here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with Scarlett Fu here in our television studio, Tim Stenevic in our radio booth, Shanali Basic taking over for vacationing Carol Masser as she tends to do in the <laughs> middle of the week. A welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms. Interesting moves in the market here today, Tim. 5,029 and change on the S&P 500. You combine that with the big moves we saw yesterday and well, we've pretty much erased all of the losses from Tuesday's sell-off. Okay, so did everybody forget about that hotter than expected CPI print? Are the I concerns did. about yep. inflation yeah. done? Frankly, We've it, moved on, Tim. It well, it depends on who you talk to. Megan Horniman has not moved on. She's very concerned about inflation. She said that they've been warning that inflation is going to be a bumpy road to get to 2%. And she thinks, Chanali, that the Fed is on track, but it's not going to hit 2% this year. And they won't see 2% maybe until 2025. So maybe rates are higher for longer. It's interesting because it, maybe the stock market might have forgotten about Tuesday, but the bond market hasn't completely forgotten about Tuesday. After that 18 basis point surge in yields on Tuesday, you only saw it come down about half that much by nine basis points in the last day or two, in the last two days, really. So we have not recovered all of those losses in the bond market yet. Well, speaking of recovering losses, Apple has uh, really pared back its losses. It was below its long-term trend line, its 200-day moving average, but that headline that Romain just told us about, about the company readying its AI tool to rival Microsoft's GitHub Copilot has moved it uh, way off its lows. Yeah, we're going to try to get you some more details on the latest news out of Apple. We have a lot of earnings coming after the bell tonight, including from DoorDash, Applied Materials, Coinbase, and Roku. Let's walk you through the numbers with the S&P 500 now officially recouping all of the losses from Tuesday's sell-off. A relatively decent rally today, up 29 points or about six-tenths of a percent. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up about nine-tenths of a percent on the day, while the Nasdaq composite is going to finish higher by about 47 points or three-tenths of a percent. But get this, Alex Steele, once again, mm -hmm. the outperformer, once again, is the Russell 2000. You're starting to see that rotation really hold here. 2.4% gain on the day, 2,061 and change. Yep, and that gap did close, so there is that. You wonder how sustainable it actually is, Tim. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, uh, <laughs> that's where that's where Megan actually said there would be opportunities in volatility, would be small caps. But taking a look at large caps, the S&P 500, relatively broad based in its gains today, peeling back the layers. Um, 83 decliners, 417 of those stocks moved higher, Scarlett. Yeah, and that's reflected in the industry groups. You talk about this rotation. There is a bit of rotation out of perhaps technology. With the real red spot, the red slice of the pie there is tech, uh, down four tenths of 1%. That's a laggard. Uh, the big Big advancers of the group uh, today, energy up 2.5%, real estate investment trust up 2.4%, and materials gaining 1.9%. Yep. All right. Let's get to applied materials. Those earnings coming out right now. Uh, adjusted earnings for the f first quarter coming in, blowing past estimates, coming at $2.13. Uh, they also saw net sales coming in at $6.71 billion. So super solid numbers uh, from them. Remember, we are interested to see what their China sales will be as well, particularly under any trade restrictions and rules remain. Yeah, interesting uh, numbers here. And you talk about this idea of what the long-term growth story is. You dig into that release, you're going to find it. Tim. Uh, all right, well, let's look at shares of Roku, which are now lower in the after hours by about 5%. Fourth quarter net revenue uh, coming in above estimates uh, for 984 to 900, uh, beating estimates of 963 million. Uh, fourth quarter net revenue beating estimates there. Uh, player revenue coming in above estimates as well. Adjusted EBITDA was $47.7 million. Uh, estimates were versus uh, a loss of year over year of $95.2 million. Estimates for 17.5 million dollars, Scarlett. Yeah, Roku shares right now down about 11 percent. Um, how much of this is tied to That's streaming and, and like trading and sympathy with the other streamers and everything that they're contending with as Roku tries to, of course, get more fees from uh, viewers? All right. Uh, well, speaking of Roku here, Trade Desk uh, really rallying here in after hours trading the big advertising platform, reporting earnings for the fourth quarter, a big beat in the fourth quarter on revenue, 606 million. The street was looking for 582, a big beat on adjusted EP. Yes, 41 cents a share. The street was looking for 38 cents a share. The company also announcing an additional share buyback, basically about $700 million. And the forecast and guidance going forward, $130 million in EBITDA for the first quarter, 478 in revenue for the first quarter, a beat 
on both of those metrics. That is your biggest gainer in after hours trading. I just also want to get back to Applied Materials for a moment because that stock really moving uh, as well up 4%. The second quarter sales view actually beat estimates if you just look at the midpoint uh, and it's net sales for the uh, first quarter for the semiconductor systems, which is basically designing and manufacturing the systems that fabricate chips also did really well. So, you know, you get rewarded when you deliver and you surprise, Shanali, end of story. Yeah, you do get uh, rewarded when you surprise. You have to also understand that their outlook here for second quarter net sales uh, is in an interesting range here. The estimate of $6.3 billion is towards the low end, below the middle of the $6.1 billion to $6.9 billion range that they're given there. Yeah, I'm always intrigued by the tech uh, and the semiconductor space because it feels like there's definitely a divide between the haves and the have-nots. Uh, anyone tied to AI, of course, does very well. And then you have someone like Texas Instruments that's struggling a little bit more because it's analog chips that's really tied more to industrial customers like car makers. And we've seen uh, what car makers are going through with the slower-than-expected demand for EVs. Now, digging into the press release uh, for Applied Materials for some commentary, Gary Dickerson, the company's president and CEO, uh, says that key semiconductor inflection support continues outperformance as customers ramp up next-gen chip tech that's critical to AI and to IoT, Internet of Things, over the next several years. Yeah, and this is, gets to this idea, too, that when we talk about uh, the development of these technologies and the actual revenue generation from them here, when do we see that? And this has been the big topic for a lot of these companies when they've come out with this. We've heard it from uh, some of the chip companies that have a much more direct connection to this. The question is, when does that broaden out? And just speaking of AI, just hearkening back, I mean, hearken uh, to Apple for a moment, because that stock is now up six-tenths of 1%. I appreciate it in relation to, say, AMAT. It's not that big of a deal, but considering it was down, as Scarlett pointed out, below some trend lines here, it's, it's writing its AI tool as well. And some of that software updates we're going to see in the iPad uh, and the iPhone will contain some of those updates, which would be reportedly quite significant, Tim. You're talking about Apple? Yeah. The, yeah. What is... What does Zuckerberg think of it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait, we should. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Scarlett, go ahead. I know more companies are. Yeah, he's going to film a video and post it on Instagram there like he go. did with the Vision Pro. Let's get to DoorDash's numbers. <laughs> uh, full, year, full year gross order value. This is the forecast here 74 billion to 78 billion. Analysts were looking for about 76 and a half billion dollars. DoorDash also authorizes a buyback of up to 1.1 billion dollars in stock. Uh, right now, the stock is trading lower by 4.5%. When it comes to fourth quarter numbers, 2.3. Yeah. $3 billion, uh, slightly higher than the expected $2.24 billion uh, in terms of fourth quarter adjusted EBITDA, $363 million, uh, better than the expected $356.2 million. Yeah, I'm just taking a look at that uh, fourth quarter forecast, the marketplace gross order value, 18.5 to $18.9 billion. Maybe that's the reason why you're seeing a little bit of lightness uh, in the shares right now. Uh, free cash flow, though, coming in, $398 million uh, for the fourth quarter. Um, gross order value for the first quarter also, I mean, kind of not as bad as maybe you would have thought, especially uh, on the high end. But again, I really yeah. question how you make who's, money on DoorDash long term. Are you, Scarlett, are you ordering from DoorDash? We've already established Alex doesn't I do that. I don't do it. I'm not. Do that. No, I don't order it because I think it's highway robbery. To That's what I'm saying. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Tim, I can, no. Tim you, you sound like a DoorDash. No way. We order once a month from Uber Eats because we get a $15 <laughs> credit from American Express. Oh. But that's enough about Look me. You, hey, I want to talk about oh, wow. a, a little bit about um, these buybacks that we've been seeing from yeah. companies that you wouldn't really consider quote unquote mature companies, yeah. but they're starting to behave in a way of like legacy companies. I mean, we saw Uber do its first share buyback, what, $7 billion earlier this week. Um, and then now DoorDash doing it? That's a big deal. It is a big deal. You have them trying to really appease shareholders at a time where, remember, DoorDash is levered to the consumer, where a day like today and this week, we worry about what the consumer looks like over the next couple of weeks. And yeah, months. absolutely. Um, it's also kind of a bright, shiny object to distract everyone, right, when you have um, a buyback. It's like, hey, look over here, look over here. All right, uh, once again, I want to go back to Apple because it came out before the market closed and it helped Apple erase uh, it, the worst of its losses. Apple did finish down, but... Uh, it is up in after hours trading, and it's no longer below its 200-day moving average. It's mm. below its 50-day and 100-day moving averages. I know technicals don't rule everything, but it was significant given how much it's been a laggard, uh, not just this year, but since its last earnings report, uh, the, the previous earnings report before the one that they announced this month. I like me technicals. Um, I also think it's interesting because this is sort of an MO, and you guys are going to talk to Mark Gurman in a second, but they do stuff after its competitors do, right? So they let their competitors mm. kind of get out there, make the mistakes, do the things, and then they they come in and swoop in and then make it apples. And I wonder if this was a strategy with AI also at the same time. 
You make a really good point. I mean, Apple did not make the first smartphone, but many people argue it's the best one. It wasn't exactly. the first tablet. It wasn't the first music player with the iPod. Really good point. Also, just a shout out to Mark Gurman. Um, huge. For huge, huge story moving the company stock before the bell and then, of course, after the bell as well. That is going to do it for Beyond the Bell, our cross-platform coverage of the market close on Bloomberg TV, radio, and Bloomberg Originals and YouTube. Meantime, catch us same time, same place tomorrow. All right, coming up, a lot more coming up here on the show, including a focus on crypto as we await those earnings results from Coinbase. A conversation coming up with Anthony Scaramucci, founder of Skybridge Capital. That's coming up next, right here on The Close on Bloomberg. Let's go back to our breaking news, which is Apple is getting ready its AI tool to rival Microsoft's GitHub Copilot, uh, nearing completion of this new critical software tool for app developers. So let's bring in from Los Angeles, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, who broke the news on the story. Mark, is this a case of um, Apple joining the party a little bit later than others, but of course with its own Apple twist? They're joining the party a little bit later than others, but like you said, with their own twist. The way Apple looks at AI, they're not going to release a chatbot. They're not going to release a chat GPT competitor, despite having one internally. They're going to apply artificial intelligence to their applications where it makes sense. And one place it makes sense is for development of software, right? We've seen from Microsoft's GitHub Copilot that AI could be extremely beneficial for speeding up the time it takes to write code. That could obviously be a tedious process. Mm. So Apple's developing a new version of Xcode that's their flagship programming software, uh, for third-party developers to be able to use AI to do code completion, to write test cases for their own apps, all using generative AI and large language models. Apple's built uh, their own large language model internally, their own competitor to what OpenAI and Microsoft and Amazon have been doing. And I expect Xcode to be one of the first places this appears. They've been testing this software. They've been dog fooding it with their own employees. Uh, and I anticipate an introduction as early as June at Apple's annual developer conference. All right, Mark Gurman there with the scoop here. Apple readying its AI tool to rival Microsoft's GitHub Copilot. We do want to get back to some other breaking news here uh, in the world of earnings. Coinbase out with its results for the fourth quarter. EPS coming in at a dollar for a share. Revenue, $954 million, a beat on both of those metrics. And a couple interesting headlines with the company saying that it's going to be adopting new accounting standards for its crypto assets. Paul Goldberg joining us right now of Bloomberg Intelligence. Paul, you've seen the numbers. What jumped out at you? I think it's the numbers are better across the board. So the trade in both consumer and in institutional are better and the subscription revenue is a little bit better than they anticipated. So positive numbers and the positive earnings. Do these earnings help us start to understand or answer the question of whether the spot Bitcoin ETF is going to be good news or bad news for a company like Coinbase? I think net net is probably good news, but I would put it into bucket. One bucket is the actual revenue that they can derive from the ETF spot ETFs, the trading associated with it and the custody services that they provide. And that's probably fairly small. We estimated it's maybe about 5% if it gets to the size of gold ETFs, maybe get a little bit bigger. But the other numbers that are working in here and what we've seen in the fourth quarter and the January volumes were very strong across the crypto assets as well, it's the sentiment. So it's given the positive sentiment for the crypto assets, which is improving the volume and in improving the prices. Obviously, yeah. the Bitcoin and Ethereum prices up very considerably. Yeah, and we saw that in the fourth quarter, fourth quarter trading volume, $154 billion, well above what the street was looking for. Paul, when that conference call comes and they have to really start to talk about the future here, what do you want to hear? I mean, I do want to hear positive numbers. So uh, when we look at the volumes on the sheet, January was very strong. January was even stronger in terms of activity than December and November. Yeah. February looks a little bit lighter, but the prices keep going up. So that should give them some. They don't guide to the volume and the trading revenues. They do guide to the subscription revenues. So the trading does still have some tailwind based on the prices. And the guidance for the subscription revenues is up from the current quarter. 
All right, Paul Goldberg over at Bloomberg Intelligence. A quick read on Coinbase here, a breakdown of those numbers. Those shares oscillating between gains and losses, but you made a really good point here. When you start to look at some of the moves in crypto assets, particularly Bitcoin, you can see where some of the optimism lies. Anthony Scaramucci joining us right now. He is, of course, the founder of Skybridge Capital. He also served as a White House communications director during the Trump administration. And, of course, you've been a big investor uh, in the crypto space, Anthony. I do just want to get your thoughts about the recent run-up that we've seen in Bitcoin. I think last time I checked, we're around 52,000, a far cry from 69, but looks like we're headed in that direction. But a, but a big move from 16, 17, 18,000 yeah. uh, towards the end of 2022, which was the Anibus Horribilis for uh, crypto. So, yeah. uh, but I, I think the one thing I would just add uh, on the Coinbase situation, everything's up. It's going to improve the staking on the altcoins, and there's huge margins in that. So even if they lose a little on the mm -hmm exchange traded funds, meaning some of their customers yeah. buy the ETF as opposed to just buying Bitcoin you know, natively right. on the exchange. Mm -hmm. They're picking up revenues from the whole lift in the overall market capitalization. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, so you think this is going to spread beyond just Bitcoin itself? I know it's already done that to a certain extent, but the narrative has always been, okay, spot Bitcoin ETFs, you don't really need Coinbase, but we forget that there's a whole other ecosystem out yeah, there. Yeah, so I, so I think what has typically happened is as you see a swelling in Bitcoin, uh, the grandfather of cryptos, it sort of spills over into the other assets. And so just, just what happens is you're making profits in Bitcoin, you start to redeploy them into riskier assets. Uh, yeah. And some of those assets are really not that risky relative to Bitcoin. As an example, Ethereum and Solana are probably now in that big boys club. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but listen, you know, you, 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 you stake with a place like Coinbase because it's safe, it's good, you know, High, highly good regulatory process inside there. It's probably one of the best run cryptocurrency exchanges in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so you feel the safety there and they do take a reasonable size of the profits as a result of that. And I, I don't think we should underestimate that. So Gary Gensler made pretty clear that the SEC was holding its nose as it approved those spot Bitcoin ETFs. What does that mean for the prospect of ETFs backed by other cryptocurrencies like Ether, like, like anything else? You are so nice because I, I you know, the, say that he was holding his nose is such a, you know, he had like a vomit bag under the <laughs> desk, like when he was like, you know, so you were just such a nice person. But, you know, to be polite. you know, what what I would say is that he's up against it because he's lost several cases. Uh, he will but would probably, it take another lawsuit to get there? I think he will. I think he will. I think he's decided that the powers that be politically uh, in the elite don't like crypto. They don't like the uh, energy around Bitcoin. And I don't think they want an ETF for Ethereum. And so that May decision, I think, gets pushed. I think it causes another lawsuit. He'll likely lose that lawsuit. Uh, and then you're coming up against the election. And so then the real question is, will Mr. Gensler in a new Joe Biden administration, will he be the SEC chairman? My, my guess is he probably won't be at that point. Um, I want to go back to Bitcoin for a moment because, of course, you made a lot of headlines when you gave a Bitcoin price forecast of $170,000 about 18 months after the halving in April. Um, given the rally that we've seen, 52000 um, above that level, what's your latest price forecast? Are you sticking with that? I, I am sticking with that. But the typical thing, what I was trying to say in that podcast was there's a technical analysis that you can do over the past 14 years. Uh, the price at the time of the halving, mm -hmm. if you multiply that by four, that's typically where Bitcoin has run to in that cycle. And so I was just using a 50 thousand dollar number mm -hmm. for April. So this could run up because there's a lot of momentum right now. You guys are seeing that the, the network is only producing 900 coins a day. And, you know, you've got 12 times the demand of that right now which is why you're seeing a price squeeze to the upside. So, so I'm going to stick with that uh, price prediction only mm -hmm. because I think it's conservative based on where we are right now. But I think people need to understand, look at what happened in NVIDIA, look at what happened to Apple over the last decade, NVIDIA over the last 18 months. It's not impossible now that this asset has been regulated mm -hmm. and has this regulatory ETF wrapper around it. Yeah. And remember, you know, I've been on but Wall Street, this is my 36th year on Wall Street. Wall Street sells product. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, these products are sold and not bought. And you have armies of people now yeah. that are putting these products in people's portfolios. Yeah. And it's very limited demand for an asset like Bitcoin. 
You actually look great for a guy who's been on Wall Street for 36 years, by the way. There's a, but, lot, of, uh, a, lot, of, a lot of Botox uh, in my forehead, <laughs> man. And I, I can give you a referral to my dermatologist if you have an interest. Uh, I might need it one day. I, I am curious, though. I mean, who is kind of in this space right now? Because you talk about how, okay, you, we, maybe we see a repeat of NVIDIA and Apple and some of these big run-ups here. But you know that takes a lot of retail interest. Some of that that really got shook out when we saw that big drop last year, uh, or in 2022, excuse me, whenever it was. Uh, are we going to see more of those people come back into it, meaning this isn't just going to be the whales and, the, and, and some of the institutional uh, and crypto faithful. So, 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 yeah. so, so it's a really good question. Yeah. And so the skeptics are saying it's the whales. Gensler himself is trying to make the argument that it's a few people that control Bitcoin. We really don't see that. Over 70 percent of the holders of Bitcoin own less than one Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, what I do see is continued adoption. And I see people like BlackRock and Fidelity adding it to their yeah. omnibus portfolios over time. And so I think this thing squeezes up and the skeptics, particularly people that are on the short side, are going to have to get out of the way. You talked about how Wall Street sells products, um, and we've seen, uh, obviously, Wall Street leaders like Larry Fink, like Howard Lutnick, talk up crypto following the launch of those spot Bitcoin ETFs. What portion of Wall Street leaders do you think really understands the dynamics and the inner workings of the asset class? Would you say it's a quarter of great them, question. a half of them? Mm, it's probably a handful of them. I, I think it's a great question. I think the answer is it's a handful of them. But here's what I would say to my Wall Street contemporaries. It's a one-way ticket towards Bitcoin, meaning the, the more research you do and you go down the rabbit hole of Bitcoin to understand the network, the decentralized properties of the network, the immutability of the network, uh -huh. uh, it becomes a very, very compelling thing. So if you look at a Paul Tudor Jones or a Stanley Druckenmiller or a Larry Fink as an example who was negative on Bitcoin yeah. 24, 36 short months ago, understood better what it was and then green lighted the ETF. And so my prediction is as people understand it better, when I hear Wall Street executives railing against Bitcoin, uh, my secondary question is how much homework have they actually done mm. or are they saying that because they are under the gun with regulators? All right. Skybridge Capital's founder, Anthony Scaramucci, the one and only. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's good to be here. Good Thank seeing you. you. All right. Coming up, we've got the top three where we focus in on the top three movers and shakers at the center of the day's big stories. This is The Close on Bloomberg. It's time now for the top three. Every day at this time, we take a deep dive into the people at the center of the day's top stories. And first up is Rod Stewart, the Rod rock Stewart. legend. Rod Stewart? Yeah. What's he up to? Well, he reportedly sold his music rights to Iconic Artist Group in a deal worth about $100 million, joining Bruce Springsteen, Paul Simon, um, and others who have also done the same. Would you... Uh, yeah, I'm always fascinated by this. I mean, I understand particularly why someone of his, his age would do this, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's like, why not? You know, yeah. you're kind of at the end of your career, let's just say Monetize. It. But you're also seeing younger artists do this now, too. I'm surprised you have artists who are in their 30s and 40s who are selling their catalog. I guess they feel like there's a big payday out there, given how much P, private equity yeah. and private capital is floating around out there. They're looking for so cash why not? flow. Yeah. This gives them that cash flow. What's your favorite Rod Stewart song? Uh, I, I don't really have one. Uh, I'm not, uh, you know, it's not that I dislike him, but I've never been uh, a huge Rod Stewart uh, person. I, I went down the rabbit hole so. listening to some Rod Stewart on Spotify before. Is this, that what so. you were doing all day? Yeah. Every time I walked by your desk, you were just bobbing your head. Yeah, I was like, Is well, she there working? you go. Um, all right, I'm taking a look at uh, someone else. Michael Burry, of course, uh, very famous for uh, the big short. Uh, he's now adding to wagers on Chinese tech giants like Alibaba and JD. Uh, I think this was uh, interesting, too, because we talk about this, and we should point out that Alibaba is now his top holding in, mm. in Skyon, mm -hmm. uh, too. But it gets to this idea, too, because so much of the conversation around this and around some of his own investments were about shorting some of these companies, yeah. right? Yeah. And he's obviously sees something there where, and I think a lot of people see it, that <laughs> some of these have fallen so far that... Honestly, some people just feel there's only one way else to go. Absolutely. And but And he's still living up to his contrarian billing, even yes. if he's going long yes. instead of going short, right? Mm -hmm. By the way, I would watch a big short sequel with Christian Bale making big bets on Chinese tech names. <laughs> okay. Oh, I, I thought you said that was in development. That's just in your head. That's in my head, okay. yes. Well, you, should, right. you shouldn't say that out loud. You could have, you you know, have... I'm going to will it to happen. Make a billion dollars. Yeah. The third person we're watching is Caitlin Clark, the University of Iowa basketball player. Oh, will she's likely still set, talking trash? 
Well, yeah. I mean, she's got reason to talk trash, yeah. right? She's going to set the, well, likely set the NCAA women's career scoring record tonight when Iowa tips off against Michigan. Ticket yeah. prices remain nearing all-time highs for a women's basketball game, pro or college. I've been getting a lot of calls uh, on this. You know, I used to live in, in Iowa City, uh, so I spent a lot of time going to these games as a kid, uh, and I still have some friends out there. And I mean, she is, to say she's a star yeah. in Iowa City would be an understatement. And she's going to be an even bigger star when she finally uh, decides to go to the WNBA or wherever she's going to play pro. She she just needs eight yeah. points tonight to become the all-time leader. I, I think she can get that. I think so, too. Yeah, so she'll get the eight points. Uh, how much trash talk do you think she's going to do? <laughs> how do you measure trash talk? I don't know. They should do a metric on that. <laughs> Where are the Las Vegas bookies on that? I bet on that. All right, uh, a lot more uh, coming up uh, here on this show, including, uh, well, a look back on this day and the promises and disappointments from the Human Genome Project. Remember that? We're going to leave you with a question before we go to commercial. I'm going to see if you can answer this, Scarlett. It's a okay. hard one. How many genes are there in the human body? Do you know? I have no idea. I didn't take AP bio. Throw this a, throw, is too throw hard a number out there. Me either. I slept through biology. Yeah, well, I'm, I mean, humanity. I all took the way. remedial bio, <laughs> and even I kind of knew this. Anyway, we're going to have the answer for Scarlett when we come back. Thank you. This is The Close on Bloomberg. On this day back in 2001, the first draft of the human genome was published. It was a race to be first with the government-funded Human Genome Project, posting its findings in the journal Nature on February 15th, and that was followed a day later by findings from Craig Ventner, Celera Genomics. It was a wealth of new information on how the body works at its most fundamental level. It was heralded by President Bill Clinton as a wondrous map that could help cure schizophrenia, asthma, even Alzheimer's. And Craig Ventner spoke of positioning Celera as the Bloomberg of biology. That's flattering, but no. Commercially, the project was a bit of a dud. Barely a decade later, Ventner complained that while the new technology helps generate a lot of information, there are very few scientists generating knowledge out of this data. Robert Weinberg, another genome pioneer who discovered the first human cancer-causing gene, said in 2010 that the information gained from the research didn't actually justify the cost. It was a bit of irony here. Solving the genome map actually raise more questions than answers. And that brings us to our question of the day. How many genes are there in the human body? The entire sequence, three billion bits of DNA, showed that humans contain only about 30,000 genes. That's less than a third of what scientists believe, and that's the crux of the problem. That lower number meant that, the, that knowing the number of genes was far less consequential than knowing how those genes interacted with each other. Without knowledge of interaction, Targeted treatments for a single biological pathway would be difficult at best, impossible at worst. That realization caused Solera and its peers to shift strategy from selling gene data to developing more mundane products like those over-the-counter diagnostic tests that collect dust at the bottom of those drugstore shelves. To an extent, the genome frenzy looked a lot like the AI frenzy. At least 60 genomics companies sprung up in the mid to late 1990s, and while some still exist and even thrive, like Insight, Myriad, and Lexicon, by the end of the aughts, many of those other companies had just faded away into the ether. Scarlett? Well done. 30,000 genes. Didn't realize that. That fantastic uh, context there on the Human Genome Project. All right, let's shift gears for a moment here because DraftKings just announced results as well. Um, there are two bits of this. Uh, let's start with the M&A part of it because DraftKings says it has bought Jackpocket for $750 million, 55% uh, in cash, 45% in stock. It also released its results for the fourth quarter. The bottom line did beat with adjusted EPS uh, coming in higher than anticipated. As for the outlook, 2024 revenue uh, raising the range to 4.65 billion to 4.9 billion. It also raised the range for its adjusted EBITDA. Nevertheless, you are seeing the stock move lower in after hours trading by about three and a half percent. All right, let's turn back uh, to uh, the job market uh, here in the United States. We did get weekly jobless claims this morning, and there's been a lot of talk about just how healthy this labor market is. Shares of Upwork did move a little bit lower today. This after the online recruitment company reported fourth quarter results yesterday. Those results did beat estimates. The company saying the outlook for the multi-billion dollar hiring sector still looks strong. Joining us now for her insight on the jobs market is Hayden Brown, the CEO of the Work Marketplace Upwork. Hayden, great to have you back here on the program here. Are we still looking at a healthy labor market? I think we are. And certainly what we're seeing in the freelance side of things from Upwork is continued strong demand from clients, small and large, 
who want to tap into the freelance economy to deliver agility, flexibility, and to close skills gaps in their organizations across the 125 categories of work that we serve. So demand is robust. We had a great quarter in Q4, and we're really looking forward to a year of durable, profitable growth in our business in the year ahead. What actually leads to that profitable growth? Is it more people using the platform, or is it finding, I guess, better ways to, uh, I guess, monetize what you already have? It's both, Romain. What we saw in the fourth quarter was 851,000 clients uh, dipping into our platform and leveraging the capabilities. And that was uh, our strongest quarter yet in terms of uh, active clients. So there's a huge demand out there from clients. We also saw larger businesses leveraging our enterprise suite, companies like Instacart, Checkout.com, NYU, you know, all types of organizations really have realized they need to be tapping into the flexible freelance economy to get critical work done. So that's happening right now. And this is a trend that started way before COVID, way before the pandemic, and is definitely enduring, particularly now with AI crashing on the scene. Companies are realizing the place they need to go to get critical workers with AI skills is the freelance economy. You know, I think about what's happening across the tech industry. Toast is the latest company to say that it's cutting workers, 550 employees. And of course, it adds to the other companies that have done so already, whether you're talking about Microsoft, Alphabet or Amazon or Salesforce. When these companies um, cut full time staff jobs, do they then turn around and increase their postings or listings for freelance jobs? You know, Scarlett, it's not always so linear, but what we do see is businesses waking up to the reality that today they really need to have a flexible workforce strategy that includes freelance workers if they want to tap into both uh, critical skill needs and also younger workers. You know, more than 40% of Gen Z workers today have chosen to freelance. And so they're realizing that if they want to be part of recruiting that next generation of workers, they have to have a talent strategy that includes freelance. They're also realizing that they can uh, have an organizational strategy that really leverages freelance workers as part of their core workforce, not just on the contingent side, you know, where these people are doing ad hoc things here and there, but really it's part of their really critical model. So that's a shift from probably what was happening 10 or 20 years ago, where companies are now using this workforce as part of their day-to-day -day operations, you know, irrespective of economic conditions and really part of, you know, Critical, critical parts of their businesses. Yeah, that's a really important uh, contrast. Thank you for sharing that, Hayden. Um, I'm curious as to which kinds of freelance roles have seen the biggest increases in pay. We're paying so much attention to wages and what that indicates about inflation. Um, and we tend to focus on full-time positions, but in the freelance world, are there certain kinds of freelance jobs that have a lot of um, pricing power? Well, main comment is no surprise that certainly folks with AI-related skill sets are commanding a huge premium in the market right now. And we've seen a growth in both demand for those skills. So that category grew 70% in our business uh, in Q4, and also a premium for those uh, skills where certainly they're commanding outsized wages. We're also seeing, very interestingly, in categories that I think many folks have said, you know, are writers or translators, are those jobs going away? We're actually seeing there is some uh, decline in volume in those categories, but actually for the jobs that remain, prices are going up. And also uh, the size of the contracts is going up. So in our writing category, for example, uh, contracts were 20% longer in duration in Q4 versus in the past. And that's because people are really looking for people with a more complex and sophisticated skill set to do bigger complex work, even as some level of automation that started before ChatGPT continues in those work areas. So it's, I think it's really good news for workers who are, you know, commanding a premium for the more complex skill sets that only humans, you know, can deploy. Well, for those employees, or, or I guess a prospective employees, if you will, that are on the site, does it sort of help them to have, uh, I guess, something that they can tout as being related to the AI space in terms of skills? It absolutely does. And I think this is where freelancers have a huge advantage. You know, we've seen through multiple tech, tech shifts in the past, whether it was the rise of the internet or mobile phones, freelance workers are the first and fastest to adopt and learn new technologies. This is because it puts food on their table and AI is no different. So, you know, learning these skills is something that freelancers are doing the fastest. We're seeing widespread adoption of AI tools and technologies across our ecosystem. And we've done a lot to to make partnerships with uh, companies like Adobe, Amazon, ClickUp, Jasper, and others to put these newer technologies and tools, including mm -hmm. AI tools, in the hands of talent so that they're using these things to deliver the best work for their clients. 
In addition to, I guess, offering the extended contracts, maybe slightly better pay because of that, is the work flexibility also there? Has that stuck with it, the idea of remote work or at least some type of flex uh, work between home and office? It's a huge selling point. And this is why freelancing was on the rise as a mega, mega trend before COVID and before remote work kind of, you know, became much more popularized. You know, people have long wanted freedom, flexibility, and the desire to work for themselves and really set their own schedule. Also to do the work that they really love and not just be in maybe like mindless meetings and, you know, doing overhead that's at the corporate level, but not really about the work itself all day long. And so when you talk to freelancers, this is why this is a huge huge part of the economy today, you know, delivering billions of dollars of value, more than 50 million Americans uh, freelancing right now. And so, again, this is a trend that started long ago and is going nowhere. It's just growing every year as more freelancers join uh, this workforce. Hayden, really appreciate your joining us and sharing your insights. Hayden Brown is the CEO of Upwork. And Romain, one thing we didn't get to is how AI plays into looking for a job as well, because yeah. they use it as a screening tool, obviously, for your cover letter. When you and I were looking for jobs out of college, we had to dazzle everyone with this incredibly tailored cover letter. But now it's more about making sure you hit upon key words so that the AI filter puts you through to the next level. It's like a video game. Uh, okay, except I got my first job through nepotism, so I never really had that. <laughs> Uh, what was but your, yeah, point, your point your point is well taken there. Uh, may, and maybe you can use that then. I mean, you know, like I said, if the companies are using AI to screen them, yeah, why shouldn't yeah. the applicants use AI you to, use to, bold, to prepare themselves? Bold uh, keywords uh, everywhere, that. right? Bold, yeah, I mean, I feel like you just need to put generative AI like 20 million times uh, in your <laughs> resume and you're, you're golden, right? Throw, throw a couple of engineers in there and like all's good, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, let's take a look at how markets closed on the day because we did get economic data. Today's uh, weak retail sales report suggests consumer spending may be starting to dial down. Is that good news for market, desperate for rate cut? Well, maybe not desperate, waiting for a rate cut. It depends on tomorrow's wholesale inflation report. Uh, the S&P 500, 5,029. The Russell 2000 uh, really leading the way up 2.5% on the day. Uh, big tech uh, was the laggard, but it did finish higher. Uh, it opened lower, but ground its way up to a two-tenths of 1% gain. And you can see yields coming down on the 10-year to 4.23% as Treasuries rose for a second day again. Next stop, PPI tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Efforts to diversify venture investing have taken a bit of a backseat to other priorities, like fundraising and simply surviving the macro environment. It's a notable change from 2020 when Act One Ventures came up with a solution of a diversity rider. Joining us now for more is Alejandro Guerrero. He is co-founder and general partner of Act One Ventures. And you created this diversity rider in 2020 in the wake of the George Floyd murder to really formalize efforts to include underrepresented uh, minorities as investors in startup deals. Can you tell us at its peak how many VC firms use the rider in their term sheets and how that compares to what's happening today? Sure. So first of all, thank you both for having me here. It's a pleasure. Um, so at its peak, we had about 200 venture firms, or there are about 200 venture firms that have signed on to unit, meaning they, are, they have established it as a standard part of their term sheet. So the same way you would ask how much money do you want to raise at what price, mm -hmm. they're asking who within our network, investor or founder, do we have that could be a great addition to the cap table, bringing a different set of networks than the ones we currently have. Okay. And what, what does the growth look like? today in 2024? It, I mean, look, candidly, it slowed down, right? Okay. I think with everything that we've seen around diversity, equity, and inclusion, it took a back seat. But I look at all of this as sort of the way I measure success in early stage startups, which is what I do. Anything of really great value should be measured in about 15 to 20 years, right? And almost any great company has one to two to three near-death life experiences. So you can kind of consider what we're going through four years out from George Floyd's the, the summer of 2020 one of these near-death experiences that we're going through, but I don't believe it's over. There's, there's too much work that's still happening right now. Do you think, though, it will accelerate maybe back to some of the levels that we saw, all the interest that corporations seem to express in 2020 and even in 2021, not just on their own in terms of what they want, but the idea that there is a lot of pushback coming from uh, whether it's their customers or just the public in general to these types of DEI initiatives. And I wonder if that didn't kill it, did it slow it enough where we're not going to see those levels again? I think a lot of the efforts that we saw were well-intentioned, but not designed to be sustainable through the first signs of turbulence. Mm -hmm. And so 
at that first sign of turbulence, which could be markets or something else geopolitically, it's easier to go back to your core business and sort of stop these other things. That's why I designed a diversity writer as mm. not a program, but yeah. as something that can live on in perpetuity within term sheets and not really just for the venture capital asset class, but any deal maker of any asset class. When it comes to the sustainability of standing by these initiatives, do you think it's easier to ensure that when you're working with startup companies, effectively smaller companies as opposed to a mature publicly traded company with thousands of employees? I, I, think, I think it's just, it takes effort, right, mm -hmm. and work. And part of what you see in deal making is this quick inertia of just, I need to find the deal, I need to win the deal, where's my best friend who I know that I went to school with, let's bring them on and let's keep moving. But if you really think about how to build great businesses, especially at the early stages, right, mm -hmm. there's two things that matter, customers and revenue. So you get customers through networks, and if you bring people from different networks, you're going to get access to better customers, to more revenue, you're going to de-risk the business, and you're going to keep going forward. So the same thing applies to every other stage, but the earliest stages where we saw a lot of the activity happening just candidly because we need to see more women and people of color as, as fund managers. You talk about how 200 VC firms uh, signed on to use the diversity rider. You envision this as a flexible tool that allows uh, deal makers to kind of adopt it to fill their own needs Correct. however they see fit. In reality, in, in practice, how did you see them using it? Can you yeah, give us look, some examples? I designed it in a way where there was no teeth for enforcement because that wasn't the point. If you yeah. tell somebody what to do with their money, they're going to close the door on you and say, don't ever come back. Mm -hmm. So. You really have to find a way to bring someone to the table where if you care about this, if you understand that at the end of the day, this isn't DEI, this is ROI. How do you get a return on the investment? Yeah. Then if you look at it from that perspective. Well, well that's the part I'm curious about because even if you don't have enforcement there, you still need some sort of measurement of yeah. progress, of yeah. that sustainability. Do you have that or the so capability of that? When I dropped it, yeah. I chose not to measure and get the reporting. And the reason was because I was getting a lot of pushback from that oh, from really? top tier firms. Okay. Not just that, right? Originally, I had actually called it the George and Brianna writer, not the diversity writer, and they pushed back on that, too. Oh, yeah. So there were a number of things that internally I was facing, but I, look, I was a founder before I'd been a venture capitalist, and you can't put a square into a circle. So you have to design it in a way where you're not telling people what to do, but you're giving them the tool sets to understand that this is a way to bring up the conversation, which sometimes can be difficult for either party sitting on the other side of the table. So from where you sit, you're on the West Coast, you're based in L.A., what's been the single most direct catalyst for this shift away from DEI, from overt DEI efforts? I mean, there's still plenty of companies that uh, believe in the mission and are just doing it, but not in such a um, clear and overt way. Yeah, look, I, again, right, it kind of goes back to a lot of things weren't designed to be in perpetuity. So they were very well intentioned, but clearly we're going through a lot of challenges right now in the economy, the markets, everything around. Do you so, think the, the Supreme Court ruling on affirmative action did anything? I feel like this is a little bit more insulated than that, right? I, I'm a venture capitalist, so I don't have an opinion from an academic standpoint. Sure. I can only talk about what I do, which is mm -hmm. the practicality of investing in companies. And when you think about company building, Again, it boils down to networks, customers, and revenue. That It's very, very simple. I think it's just become overcomplicated because mm -hmm. of what's happened outside from the venture capital perspective. All right, well said, uh, Alejandro. You're doing some great work, you and your team over there at Act One. Alejandro uh, Guerrero, co-founder and general partner of Act One Ventures. All right, stick with us. A lot more coming up on the show, including a push ahead to some of the big market moving events over the next 24 hours. This is Bloomberg. All right, a big turnaround in the market yeah. coming off that big CPI report, the big disappointment that we had on Tuesday. Another big inflation report set to drop tomorrow morning with the producer price index here in the U.S. Anna Wong joining us right now over at Bloomberg Economics to talk about what to expect. And Anna, should we expect another big surprise? Well, what we are looking for in the PPI is what happens to airfares and medical care services, because those are the two categories which the Fed's uh, preferred inflation index core PCE deflator takes in. So they don't take in the CPI number. Um, and we sh saw this week that the, the CPI airfares number and Medicare services are very big. But we are expecting that uh, um, the PPI numbers tomorrow will imply that the core PCE deflator will be growing more in the vicinity of 0.3% on a monthly pace, uh, which is lower than the CPI blowout number. 
Um, and ultimately, what matter for the Fed is what happens to 12 months change in core PCE deflator by March. And we are expecting that to show that uh, it will be 2.6 percent on a year year basis, which would meet a condition for cutting rates by that. OK, the other thing that um, is worth mentioning is that oil prices did rise slightly in the month. And I know the Fed looks at core, which strips out oil uh, and food prices. But will something like that eventually spill over into wholesale inflation and therefore into PCE as well? Yeah, so for the Fed, when they do take into account a gasoline price increase, it is if that spillover to inflation expectations first. And so far, we are not seeing this. And if anything, inflation expectations have been plunging. And this Friday, we're going to see a University of Michigan consumer report, which will, again, suggest that short-term inflation expectations have come down. What do you make, uh, kind of reconcile what we saw out of that CPI report, what we might see tomorrow out of that PPI report, and then, of course, that big surprise that we saw in the retail sales report today that apparently showed we're not spending any money anymore? Yeah, I think I think January data tends to be very volatile, and both the CPI and the retail report probably exaggerated what's really going on. So I think what's really going on is that disinflation continues to make progress. Uh, how and uh, consumers are also uh, still spending. So if you just like average out the last three months, that's basically the narrative you're getting. I think the real test of uh, narrative I just presented would be in uh, the March data. And um, I expect we would be correct. All right. Well, uh, you and your team, Anna, are frequently correct. Uh, really uh, doing some great work down there at Bloomberg Economics. Anna Wong, we'll catch up with her probably tomorrow. Of yeah. course, that is going to be the big data point tomorrow here. We're going to set you up for some of those big market moving events over the next uh, 24 hours. And that starts at 8.30 a.m. Washington time. Big, big data dump because you've got wholesale inflation. That's the producer price index. You've got the University of Michigan yes. consumer sentiment data. That comes after the market opens. You also have housing, housing starts, data, yeah. which um, is pretty critical given the uh, home building sentiment has been improving quite a bit. It's interesting, too, because we talk about how that feeds into consumer sentiment. We were talking about with uh, Nicole Webb over at Wealth Enhancement Group saying that's really weighing on a lot of people's yeah. minds. And that's where a lot of the inflation expectations of yeah. uh, that bugaboo really is right now here. So it'll be interesting to see whether that could right size. In addition to the data, mm -hmm. we're going to hear from more Fed members. More Fed I know members. Your favorite. Yeah, Michael yeah. Barr, uh, your favorite's not speaking. He spoke today. Uh, Tom Barkin and Mary Daly at the NABE. Of course, will be parsing through their comments um, to hear what they're thinking about when it comes to 2% and inflation. All right. And of course, as we focus on the macro, the micro always in focus. Earnings season, it never stops, Scarlett. We're going to get a few tomorrow morning. Yeah, we hear from Cinemark. Uh, we hear from Air Canada. And Archer Daniels Midland will be interesting, given all the accounting yeah. issues, right? Yeah. Do they have an accountant anymore? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot going on uh, there. Uh, I, I am curious, though, to see how they right size that yeah. ship, too. I'm also interested in Cinemark, too. I mean, we had kind of seen a bit of a rebound in terms of uh, ticket sales, box Over the office summer sales, but I don't know. I mean, where's the next Barbie or the next Oppenheimer or something else to get us back in there? We talk about how January and the weather kind of screwed up a lot of the economic data. I don't know how many people were going to the cinemas. They were escaping the heat over the summer, but maybe not so much in the winter. All right. Well, that does it for us here on The Close. Join us tomorrow for a full breakdown of all the market action. In the meantime, stick around. All your politics news coming up after the break with Balance of Power right here on Bloomberg.